and we'll get into the first exercise. So <clears throat> we go into the unit one overview, we see what we're covering this um, unit. And it's basically all the um, repair tools that Photoshop has, and then we'll also be learning how to colorize photos. So we're going to be taking um, some, in this first exercise, a damaged black and white photo, and we'll be following along with the tutorial to um, repair it, and then we'll be adding color to it. So as you see, we'll be learning about the healing brush tool, the patch tool, spot healing brush tool, clone stamping, using layers, copying selections, uh, using the transformation tool, blending tools, layer masks, opacity, noise reduction, sharpening, and adjustment curves. Okay, and all that is contained in the first exercise. And then most of that you probably will end up using for your first project. Okay, so um, let's just click the next button here and I'm gonna zoom in so it's easier to see this on the screen. So in this exercise, we restore an old damaged black and white photo and then add color into it. Okay, so step one, download this JPEG file and save it to your files. I'm gonna go ahead and just save it and find it. Okay, so this is the image. We've got uh, this old ripped photograph so it's got a big rip coming across the top. There's some spotting. Um, part of the photo is actually ripped where the guy's face is. So that'll be fun to replace uh, part of his forehead and eye. Um, but so there's our image. Let me just go ahead and let's see, Xer. Exercise one, let's put this guy on the desktop. Okay, open it up in Photoshop. Okay. And let's see what the next step is here. So we have our exercise file downloaded. <clears throat> next, follow these instructions to repair the damaged photo. You can either use the web page format or a PDF. So there's a PDF that you can download if you prefer that. Otherwise, um, we got this file uh, from this tutorial on, on Toots Plus, um, but I, I copied it, got rid of all the ads and stuff, and it's available at the uh, web page link that I gave you there. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this over to the side. So I've got my instructions. I'm going to open up Photoshop with my file. And if you guys, if you're, um, if your Photoshop doesn't look the same as mine, the way, the way to like get it all to default if you'd like to, if you've already set up stuff personally and stuff, by all means keep it. But if you want yours to be default the way mine is, um, you can just go to Window, Workspace, and I'm going to choose Essentials. And then in case something has changed in there, you can go to Reset Essentials. Okay, um, so I'm just going to choose Reset Essentials and it kind of resets how the whole layout is there. Um, now, first things first, this is for every project that we do, okay? Um, always keep an original copy of your image um, unedited, okay? Because I want to see how it was before you worked on it. And also, I would like to be able to verify the files you have and stuff like that. So, um, when you have a background image, just go ahead, first thing, always do, Command-J. Let me, let me turn back on my key casting here so you guys can see what I'm doing. Um, delete what I just did, but Command-J duplicates the layer, okay? Control-J if you're on a, on a Windows machine. And then I like to make a uh, group uh, with just originals in it, okay? And then I just don't touch those. In case I mess something up, I've got the original file um, able to, to that I can work with. Um, you'll notice because this is locked, I can't copy it into the folder, so just made a duplicate. I'm going to get rid of that. So, but in my originals here is my original full, uh, image, not edited at all. And I'm just going to leave it right there, turn that group off, and um, I've got it if I need it. Okay, so. Um, originals. There we go. Okay, so introduction. 
he talks about why he uh, did what he's doing. Print size is limited due to this. Uh, don't worry about that stuff. Um, so when it comes to print size, it, and if you're working with an original old image like this, you want to scan it at a good quality so that later they could print it, you know, anywhere up to 8 by 10. So the best way to know how to get the right resolution is by um, calculating. So if you want, a, normally a good quality print is at 300 dpi. And say we're going to do an 8 by 10 image. And so the long end of it would be 10 inches at 300 dpi. 300 dpi means dots per inch. So if it's 10 inches and there are 300 dots per inch, you just need to multiply that 10 by 300. Okay? And so you would want an image that was at least 3,000 pixels tall um, on the long end for something that was, say, an 8 by 10 or, or something equivalent to that size. Okay? Um, if you want even higher, like double that, that good print quality, if you want something like 600 dpi, it would just take that dpi and multiply it by the long end. So we would want something at 6,000 dpi. Now, if we go in and look at this image, um, and we go to image, image size, we see that this is 2 inches by 3 inches at 200 dpi. So definitely not something that's good enough quality for printing, but um, it works just fine for our tutorial. Um, you will notice though for the project I ask you to um, keep a fairly good resolution. Okay, So step one, um, already specified dimensions, crop the image. You don't need to worry about that part. Step two is the patch tool. Okay, so what he does here is um, he says the patch tool works like a marquee in regards to behavior. You drag a selection around the area you want to fix, click the middle, hold the mouse button, so you drag it um, to another location. It basically replaces what's in that area um, with something new. So if I um, Normally this might show the spot healing brush tool in this icon right here, but if I go to that and right click on it and then go to patch tool, um, that'll be the tool that we're using here. So um, as he shows, he just kind of selects this area here and then you'll see how it works. So go ahead and drag around this little area as a selection. Notice how it's kind of um, just drawing a little line where I drag the mouse. And that's where your selection ends up being. So, um, oh, and make sure you're working in the right layer. See how I have this group selected? So I'm working in a layer that, um, or I have a group selected that's turned off. So it's telling me I can't do anything with this, which is correct. So if you ever see something like that, it usually means you're working in the wrong layer. So let's um, select our layer here and so notice it has this icon. See how it shows like this little arrow pointing out. So basically you just grab this inside area and you drag to somewhere else, okay? And where I'm dragging it to, that's what it's going to use to replace the contents um, of that selection. So um, since, we're, since we're working with this curtain, I don't want it to be kind of the same. I'm just gonna drag up and it's gonna fill it with the curtain from above, okay? And so that's kind of okay, it's not perfect, but we'll get in there and um, fix those irregularities, okay? So um, aligned it, and then um, we'll go ahead and fix some of these other areas, I'm making a selection around them, and just dragging. Trying to align like the the shadows here, and so it's not it doesn't do a perfect job first time around. Sometimes I'm just going to select this other spot. Oops. Okay, Command D will deselect whatever selection you have. Okay, so I've kind of roughly filled in those areas. Um, and then it says after getting the larger areas done um, of the curtain, go ahead and use the clone stamp tool. So 
the clone stamp tool, let me rename this layer while I'm at this here. Um, okay, so the clone stamp tool, um, what that does is it basically copies exactly um, what you have selected with your brush. So when I select the clone stamp tool, you'll see my brush here and I can, I can adjust my brush size by doing the brackets, right bracket or left bracket will make it bigger or smaller. Okay, and if I hold Alt, I can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel. Okay, see I'm zooming in and out with the scroll wheel. And I can go into some of these um, rougher areas and use my clone stamp tool by clicking. See how when I press Alt, um, and it shows this like kind of um, target area. So when you press Alt and click, that will be the source of what you're using for your clone stamp tool. So just to show how it works, I'm gonna, I'm gonna alt and click on this little dot. And see when I drag my cursor now, it's, it's using that dot that was up here as the source um, for filling in the area where my brush is. So if I were to click here, it actually uses, see how it comes up with this crosshair? And that crosshair um, is the source of where I'm actually pasting with my brush, okay? So um, I'm gonna undo that. So I obviously don't wanna use that as my source, but so I've got this line left over from the clone stamp tool here. I'm gonna fill that in just by clicking, alt click, press alt, and then click, and it's not showing those keystrokes, but, and then I'm gonna fill this area in here, okay? And again, it's using, when you press alt, it's saying that's the source, of what you use to fill in, then when you use your brush, it fills it in, okay? And so I'm gonna get in and get some of the other details here um, a little bit better. I'm using a soft brush, so you can change the hardness of your brush here. Um, usually a soft brush like kind of leaves fewer traces of the Photoshopping. Um, so a soft brush works well in a lot of cases. Okay, so I just, I just all clicked up here and then kind of filled in some more of this rip. We'll get to the stuff on the guy's face in a little bit. Um, got a rip coming out of the ear over here, so I'm gonna alt click here and kind of come around this ear off a little bit better. Okay, I've got some other like little irregularities with the um, and what I'm doing, see I'm holding the space key and it's doing this thing, it's kind of annoying, but when you hold the space key, then you can drag your image around. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm holding the space key and dragging the image. Let me see if I can keep it from... I wish it wouldn't just keep repeating the space key when I'm just holding it down, but okay. So I'm just dragging this around looking for spots that need a little bit of clone stamping done. Okay. And remember, like, you don't need to zoom in at, you know, I'm at 2000% now and look for inconsistencies. You don't need to zoom in to 1000%. You know, just zoom in a little bit. If there's an inconsistency, you can see it like, you know, maybe 200% you want to fix it. But if it's something that's only visible at 2,000% at, um, or 1,000%, don't worry about it. Okay, so get a little bit bigger brush here and just fill in some of the sides of this image. Notice where I clone stamped before. It was, it's a little bit... Um, darker for some reason, so I'm going to try to lighten that up a little bit, get the consistency of the shading a little bit closer here. Okay. 
Okay, so I think the curtain looks pretty good right there. Excuse me, let's see what, what we've got here now. It says after, after, let's see. <clears throat> so due to larger areas with patch tool, we did. After getting the large areas done, change to the healing brush tool and the clone stamp tool. So we just um, looked at the clone stamp tool. Let me show the healing brush tool. So in the same um, little group as the patch tool is the spot healing brush tool. And also the healing brush tool. There's a difference between the two. So the healing brush tool works a lot like the clone stamp tool in that you pick a source to make the correction and then it uses that to it uses that source to try to repair what's in the area you're selecting so it, it's a little bit hard to differentiate what it does between that and the clone stamp tool and here's what it is the clone stamp tool copies it directly whereas the healing brush tool um, tries to like do a mixture of what is inside of your brush area and what is um, what the source image is. So it tries to repair it. Okay, so um, for example, I can show it with his eye. If I use his eye as the source and then I come up here and try to put the eye with, remember I'm using the healing brush tool now. If I, if I use that as a source and I put it here, see how it does a mixture of what the eye is and what's in that area? So it's like a, a lighter version of the eye. And then, so if I go to the clone stamp tool and do the same process, I'm gonna use the eye as my source and go up here and click, and it basically just copies it, okay? Um, it basically copies it to the new location instead of trying to do a mixture. So whereas the, um, the healing brush tool like kind of mixes the two, the clone stamp just directly copies it. Okay, so if, let's see if there's some areas that maybe need the um, healing brush tool. Not a lot, maybe right here there's a little bit of a spot. I think a soft brush with the clone stamp tool kind of got a lot of this stuff already. Um, I guess I can start getting into his hair a little bit now and some of these other areas. Let's see. Spot on his face, I think. Oh, I am in the clone stamp tool, actually. The spot on his face could probably use clone stamp tool. And we got here. Here. And for this one, I'll use the spot healing brush tool. So that's my source, that's my fix. Ooh, I don't like how it did that. Okay. Probably come in and start fixing some of this stuff on his jacket. Maybe a little bit more detail than I need to worry about, but while I'm at it, might as well. It's quick and easy. Okay, so that's that's the uh, spot healing brush tool and the clone stamp tool. Okay, now it says that I'll let you all read this, but. I kind of described what the two do. So it's talking about all the places in the photo that need to be repaired. Notice his image looks a little bit different from mine. I think mine is a little bit tighter cropped, I guess. Okay, so we've basically gotten everything outside of his face repaired so far. Um, 
<clears throat> and now it says, for the serious defects in our picture, we'll use the man's right eye to substitute his missing left eye. Just draw a rough marquee selection around his eye, and then press Command-J to jump the layer, copy the selection to a new layer. Yeah, so I showed you that before. Command-J will duplicate the selection. If you have an entire layer selected here, and you press Command-J without having anything else selected, it'll duplicate the entire layer, okay? Now, if you make a selection, so as they're showing in here, they're, they're kind of selecting the left side of his face. So if I make a selection with the marquee tool here, using the rectangular marquee tool, and I'm gonna copy all the way down to his mouth, all the way over almost to his right eye. So if I make that as a selection in Command-J, it will duplicate um, just what I have selected, okay? So, and I'm pressing, I'm holding the Alt key and clicking the eyeball to show only that layer. But so that's what I have selected, and when I press Command J, that's what it duplicates. Okay. So now it says to select that, copy it to a new layer, and then Command T to transform it. So Command T will um, take your selection and put it in this box, and then you can actually kind of transform it at will. Okay. So I think what we're going to do is flip this. And, okay, so we're not gonna flip it on our own. We're gonna right click and go to flip horizontal. You notice it just flips that uh, transformation area. And then it says at this point, when you drag the selection over out to where the left eye should be, you would want to lower the opacity and line the eye with what's left of his torn away eye behind your new layer. Okay, and so when so just hit the checkbox, and when you go to do that, it's saying to try to align it with the layer underneath. So if I drop, if using this eye copied, I'm going to call this eye copy. Okay, so if I use my copied eye layer and I drop the opacity, then I can start to see what's underneath that layer, and then I can kind of move it around. Um, to the correct place. Okay, so I'm just looking at where his eye was there. I want to kind of line this one up to be in the same spot. Okay, so um, I think that eye is about in the right spot. So if I increase this opacity, um, I'll follow along here then. When you have a line, hit enter or hit the mark I've placed the green circle around. Oh yeah, hit the little check mark to um, accept the location that it's been placed in and raise the opacity back to 100. Okay, so we've done that. So we've moved it around, we got it into the right spot and <clears throat> it's back up to 100% opacity. Okay, so now that we've got the eye in place, what I think we're going to do is mask out everything around it. Yeah, now with the layer selected, hit the mask button. And so this is the mask button right here. Um, this will make a mask in the current layer to apply a mask. And notice it comes up with this kind of white box right here. Okay, so how a mask works if you don't know, some of you may know, I'm not going to assume, but how it works is basically anything in this mask layer that is, oh, I think I just sh showed something behind the camera here. Let me show you guys. Okay, this is the mask button right here. Okay, um, so let me get rid of this mask and show you again. So with your with your layer selected, if you click this layer right here, that will make the mask, okay? If you click that layer, and that makes this white selection, which is a mask. Anything in your layer that you're currently working in with the mask, anything that's white in this mask will show through. Anything that's dark will not. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna fill this layer 
um, with black by just inverting it. So I'll press Command I, I will make it all black. And notice now everything is hidden from that layer. As I toggle Command I to make it either black or white, it is either revealing or hiding what's in that layer. Okay. So with everything hidden, what I'm going to do now is is get my brush and I'm going to click this to make the default white and black uh, foreground and background colors. You can do this little arrow to switch between them. But I want white. I want a white paintbrush. And what I'm going to do is just come back in and start painting where the eye is from that layer. Okay, with my white. Notice it's revealing what is in that layer. Okay, so notice I'm getting this little white spot here. That white spot is the area of that mask that is revealed because white reveals and black hides in a layer mask. So I'm gonna kind of just use this mask to fill in everything I can here as far over. Okay, so right at this point I start to get to his other ear. So I think what we're noticing here is that um, this section of his head is like proportionally a little bit different. So I'm going to guess that his hair is kind of coming down this way. And then we would have a lot of space in here. So what I'm thinking is this eye needs to be like moved over just a little bit more here. And I'll fill that in a little bit more there. Okay. And his eyes don't seem too close. I've got some good good spacing and um, as you can see, see, see how his eye starts to come in from that area I cut a lot earlier than the, or the ear starts to come in a lot earlier than the other ear. So we're probably just not going to use that portion of it. Okay. But I think, I think the eyes are kind of spaced right. Maybe Maybe this eye is a little bit larger than the other one. So I just press Command-T um, to transform that layer. And I'm holding Shift to keep it all um, proportional. When I change the proportions, if you hold Shift, it will keep it proportional. Okay, and it's kind of hard to do with so much of his face missing on the left, but what I'm trying to do is just get the eye proportional and, and kind of fit in the area correctly. So, okay, there it is. So I, I think it's kind of um, in the right spot. <clears throat> and this, here, this goes through how um, to use a layer mask, which we just discussed. Okay, and as he mentions, the X button, um, flips back and forth between these these two black and white. And that's that's handy when you're working in a mask because you're usually using either black or white. But um, if I were to use gray, it would partially reveal. Um, okay, so now it says, now you want to do the same process with the ear. Depending on the picture, you would try out different free transform modes. Um, you would try out different free transform modes you also could use. Okay, so for the ear, I did use warp. I did a minor part of the hairline from the man's right side, rotated, and scaled it slightly just to get a better start for the missing hairline. Then I cloned it where I needed to. Okay, so I'm just gonna do basically the same, um, M is for marquee, basically the same thing here, and select kind of his hairline and his ear. Okay, and I'm gonna duplicate that. And call it hair and ear. Okay, and then Command T to transform. I'm going to right click and flip it horizontal. Okay, and kind of move this to a spot, <clears throat> like noticing his jowl line. Let me go ahead and drop the opacity here so I know where I'm putting it. Noticing where his other ear is and kind of trying to get it into a reasonable spot. Um, maybe I need to stretch it out a little bit. I'm trying to get the chin right. 
I'm going to make sure it's kind of lining up with the ear underneath. Lining up with the hair above. I think that's a pretty good spot right there. Okay. So now I'm going to make a mask. I'm going to click right here to make a mask. And I will start kind of using my black brush. I'm going to press B for brush. Start using the black to kind of hide um, areas of this image that I don't want to use. Okay. So start hiding the hairline a little bit. I'm just kind of doing the edge of this to blend in um, to the other hairline, what hair I have here. Okay. Just kind of blending this a little bit. Notice everywhere that I'm painting, it's just hiding that part of the image, which is exactly what we want to do. Okay, oh, and I forgot to put my opacity back up. Let's see where we're really at with this. Okay, not bad. Switch over to white and kind of fill it in, get a feel for where it's going here. That left side of his face is obviously a little bit brighter than the right, so I'm going to hide some of that glow that's going on. Okay, so that fills it in, but like what I really don't like and what often happens with this is see how much space there is between his eye and this part of the hairline. I, I think that it might be because his, his um, head is turned slightly more or something on this side, and so it just starts starts getting a little bit weird. Let's see if... Yeah, I'm just going to do a little bit more copying here. So I'm just going to select some of this hair and duplicate it and move it to the top layer so it's on top of everything else. And then I'm going to kind of move this um, maybe down this way a little bit. And what this may or may not work, but what I'm trying to do is fill in some, like there's just too much open space right here somehow. Um, let's see what this one is doing. A little bit more. Let this hair come in here. Probably move our eye a little bit more over to fill in some of that space. I feel like that's a little bit better. Like, so this is the hard part about working with faces is just getting proportions right. So I'm just kind of hiding that top area and looking to see what I think the proportions are, whether they look good or not. I, I think they're pretty good. When I start zooming out, it seems a little bit wide here, but not as bad as it was. Let's see, do I need to use this hair at all? Um, 
Maybe a little bit. Let's see how it looks. I may decide not to keep it. Oops. I may decide not to keep it. Yeah, I don't think it looks great, but um, for our purposes, I think I'm going to keep it there because there's just not much else to work with when there's such a big rip. Um, so let's see here. I've got these to make up the hair, so I'm going to put those in a group. Let's see. That's the hair and the ear. Hair and ear. And then <coughs> excuse me. Okay. So we've kind of got the ear filled in. It looks like a little bit of a big ear. Uh, maybe, let's see, which layer is that ear? Maybe I stretched it out a bit, but I think what I'm going to do instead is just um, just mask it out a bit. Kind of make it look like it's more in the right spot. There we go. Okay. There's still a little bit weird. I think what it is, is it, it's hard to tell, but he is, his face is slightly pointed to his right, our left. And so this ear angle, when stretched, just doesn't quite look right over here. Um, but that's okay. It's probably as close as we're going to get with this kind of low quality image we're working with here. Okay, so we kind of have his hair and his ear. Let's see what this talks about next. So he's talking about filling in. Um, filling in the ear. Look at my layers here, don't be confused. Okay, you guys, I think, can manage your own layers. <clears throat> it's really important to make sure you're naming your layers and keeping them organized. Um, that is part of the grading, too, so um, keep that in mind. Okay, so he also cut another little piece of hair out to put up here, uh, which is fine. This is after getting all the larger parts in place, I went back to the clone tool and retouched up all the edges I needed to fix. This is what I put in its own layer, the retouch layer. Okay, so let's see. This is what I put in its own layer, the retouch layer. Usually you want the opacity on the clone tool set down so that you get a better control of the cloning and can do them in more than one sweep. Just drag over that area until you get the result you desire. Command Z is of course something you want to keep your fingers at during the whole of this process. So that if you don't like that part of it, then you can just undo it. Often when you go about doing the last retouching, you would want to use different layers for different parts. If you don't want a lot of layers, just merge them down when you're satisfied. I usually do small parts on different layers and then merge them back to one retouch layer, but never merge the basic layers. So he's just talking about when you're actually repairing the rest of these parts of the photo, whether you want to put it in its own layer to do that or not. Um, let's keep reading here. I usually do small parts on different layers and merge them back and do a retouch layer, but never merge the basic layers. If you don't want to merge everything together, if you later see something you didn't spot right away, it's always good to be able to go back and delete only the retouch layer, fix that, or the one layer, and or the eye layer if you find something out of place and so on. Okay, so 
what he's saying is that basically once he has these retouches done, he basically duplicates that. So I just selected this and the group that has two other layers in it and press command J to duplicate that. And what you can do is select only the layers you've duplicated. Okay, so I, I can make a group here for all the retouches. Okay, and that's all the retouches I've done in separate layers to this point. Okay, and I could turn that off. And then I have some duplicated layers here. What I can do with those and a copy of this base layer that I had is select them all. Get that in the right spot. I want it right there between those. Okay, select them all and I can go up to layer, merge layers. And what that does is it puts everything that I had done so far merged together in one layer. Okay, so what that's doing is it's giving me like one kind of master copy to work off of. So, so I'm going to call that retouch. I'm going to call this group here the retouch work that I did. Retouch work. Okay, and my retouch layer I can I can go in and start fixing some of this other stuff. So. Um, what we want to do is I'm going to try starting off with the clone stamp tool um, to just start like using parts of the above layer to just fix this crease that's happening, this big rip. Okay, so I'm just going back up, clicking Alt, selecting um, parts of the layer above to use uh, to fill in this big rip that's happening across his face, okay? Use this side of the face to kind of fill in where some of the rip is over here. And also what this does is it lets you like continue working without having to figure out which layer had, you know, this, which was it the ear layer or the eye layer that was filling in this part? Which one do I want to edit? Which one, you know, do I need to go in and retouch? Once it's all grouped together, you can just do it all at once. Kind of makes it easier. Okay. Got this little area of his hair here. Okay, now you, you'll see if you look closely what happens with this and what happens with a lot of people's is like you still have this kind of, oops, this kind of shaded thing happening here. So the top of his forehead for some reason is a lot, um, is a lot, um, let's see where we see it here. The top of his forehead is a lot brighter or darker, I mean, than like right along where his eyebrows are. So you have to kind of get that shading a little closer and not have this like kind of ridge going across his head, which is often a problem um, that people have with this exercise is they end up with this ridge going across his head. And I think it's just from not using a large enough brush or like not following like the, the um, angle of his eyebrows that are going here, making sure you're kind of going all the way around. So I think most of my ridge is kind of gone. Okay, so we've still got some little bit on the ear here. Let's fill some of these in where maybe I didn't get it perfect when I was copying before. Um, okay, it's a little soft in the ear, but I think it's basically there. Right? Yeah, I think we're basically there. So I'm, now I'm just gonna like, kind of look at the background a little bit before I'm done with this and see what, you know, where it might be a little bit uneven that I can kind of fill in. Um, 
see just a few little spots and stuff that are easy to fix. Just clone stamp and everything. Okay, the background looks fairly consistent. Um, the face is pretty much there. Maybe, maybe I want to just, oops. Let's see, maybe. There we go. See one little dot here. Kind of very light line here. There we go. Okay, so I think basically the uh, the repairs are done. Let's see what this has after that part. So he talked about grouping them all into a layer and then retouching that one. Um, So I think we're kind of at that part. Now the restoration part is done. I think we're there, okay? Restoration part, oh, and you know what I haven't done this whole time is press save, that's, that's a no-no. My bad, good thing I remembered it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and Justin, repair. I need to save my work. Save, save, save. Okay. There we go. It's saved. Saved. So now the next step, it goes into um, doing some uh, adjustments. Okay. So the next thing I do is select all the layers in the, and group them. We've already done that. I already selected the layers. I put the retouches into um, a layer here, and I've done like the final retouches to that layer. Okay. So I've got my retouch layer done. Um, and then I'm going to make a new layer from the group. I'm just going to copy my retouch layer, okay? And I'm going to call it noise. Rename it noise. This layer is for noise reduction. One thing I want to point out, which I probably haven't mentioned. So I think he's talking about how he likes to group everything in one final group and then duplicate that into a layer. Um, for his noise reduction. So we've got that going here. We've got our noise layer. As you can see from my layers below, I've kept the original file in the Photoshop for the background layer and then turned it off. Well, we did that too. Remember, you should do that for every project. Keep your original unedited image or images, if you're using multiple images, and put them in an originals um, folder unedited and just turn it off. So I always start off working by copying this original layer and working from the copy. Yes, definitely. Okay, step 17. Now we remove the noise in the image. Noise reduction is done in, a, in various ways, but here I use the reduced noise filter found under noise. Okay, so I exaggerated the noise reduction a little for this tutorial. I believe my original numbers were eight for the strength and 20 for detail. Okay, so let's just go into filter, noise, reduce noise. Filter, I have our noise layer selected. Filter, noise, reduce noise. Okay, so it gives you a little preview of what you're working with here. Um, he said he used a strength of 8 and 20 for detail. Let's see what that looks like as a starting point. 20, reserve details. Twenty. Okay, so I'm going to turn on and off the preview here. See what it looks like. It's making the image a little soft, but I think I'm okay with it. I think I'm okay with it. So I'll go with his settings, eight and 20. Okay. Another tip here is to go into the advanced dialog and crank the strength up to full in the blue channel with zero on details. Okay, I'm not gonna get into the color channels here with doing this. 
this. So I've reduced the noise in the picture. Next step, after noise reductions, we want to go on to sharpening. Sharpening is another big topic, and he's right. There are a ton of different ways to do sharpening, and people have so many different um, versions of what they think the right way is to do sharpening. I'm not very concerned with the method of sharpening, and I'm sure he presents a pretty basic um, way of doing it. Sharpening is another big topic, but a common one to use is the high-pass sharpening, and that's fine. There's, there's a few different ways of doing sharpening. If you guys want to just use, let me just duplicate this noise layer and we'll call it sharpening. <clears throat> and there's a couple different ones to use. So if you go to filter, sharpen, and go to um, unsharp mask, that's one good way of doing sharpening. This gives you a lot of different um, options with this. So one, one way of just re, um, increasing the contrast in an image is to set the unsharp mask amount to a high amount and the radius to a high amount. And that see how much that changes the, um, the uh, contrast in the image. So if you had a low contrast image, that's a way of increasing contrast. We don't really have a problem with contrast in this, so if we reduce the amount to maybe 30 and the radius to maybe 2, 1.7 to 2. Um, that's doing a fair amount of sharpening without kind of overdoing it. So you always want to sharpen as much as possible without overdoing it. And typically sharpening is like one of the last steps. Okay, so excuse me, that's unsharp mask. That, that is one way of sharpening. Okay, I'm going to say sharpening and sharp for unsharp mask. So that's one method of doing it. I'll show you his method also. So I'll duplicate this noise layer again and put it on top and I'm going to call this um, high pass. High pass sharpening. Okay. Common one to use is high pass sharpening. When you apply the high pass filter you would want to use low settings. So for this tutorial I've raised the values a bit too much and you would want to say see less gray in the picture than here. The edges are what you want to sharpen. There are also some technical issues that you want to keep in mind. When you sharpen for print, you always want to over sharpen a little bit because printers have a natural effect of blurring an image a little bit. When you have applied the high pass filter, you would set the blending mode to overlay or soft light. I usually make a use of a little over sharpen anyhow and then lower the value by lowering the opacity of that layer. And that makes sense. So um, let's go ahead and go through these steps. So I'm going to go to filter, other, high pass. Filter, other, high pass. Okay, and so he is using, I can't even see what, what amount is he using. he say? I think it says 1.2. Does it say 1.2? Maybe. 1.2. So notice the high pass filter kind of um, attempts to find the edges of the object. They use contrast to find the edges of something. So when the radius is low, then you'll have a low amount of edges selected. Okay. If the radius is high, then it will like select more of the pictures. So it's not like using a high setting is not doing a whole lot for the high pass filter. But if you use kind of, you know, 1.3, 1.2, the high pass filter is kind of finding um, some of those edges and, um, and pointing them out. So we've got a high pass filter here. And then what we do is we set that blending mode for the filter. So this where it says normal right here, drop that down and go to overlay okay and you can see as I toggle this on and off it's applying um, what overlay does is, is it is it applies contrast uh, based on the lightness and darkness so it's um, is applying contrast um, over top of the layer underneath so if I turn on only this layer that's what it looks like okay but if I turn on the layers underneath, it's applying that contrast to those layers. Okay, so that's that's the sharpening using high pass. This is it using unsharp mask. 
Um, to be honest, for this image, I think I'm liking the unsharp mask better. But either one work. Either one works. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and leave um, unsharp mask for mine. Okay, I'm going to hit save again, make sure I'm saving. Okay. Bonus tip, if you want to sharpen only areas of the picture, you could mask away certain parts. Yes, got it. So he, for example, um, was only sharpening the face, which we can do that very easily by making a mask layer. Clicking right here, making a mask layer. Um, I'm going to make it all black to hide what the layer is doing. Then I can take a brush and paint in with white over the man's face. And then the sharpen layer that I made <clears throat> is only being shown in the areas that I've painted over. Okay. Okay. In this final step, I adjusted the contrast with an S-curve. This step I didn't make use of in my original file, and you'll probably want to do it before the sharpening. But I added it here just to get a more complete workflow. Okay, so he's just adding contrast um, to the image using a curves layer. So if I take that noise layer again and duplicate it, and I'm going to rename it to um, contrast, what you can do here is go to image adjustment and go to curves. Okay, and this is adjusting the curves for this layer. And basically, um, what the curve shows is a histogram. And if you don't know how a histogram works, um, this left side of the histogram is the dark parts of the image. The right side of the histogram are the bright parts of the image. So all the way to the right is pure white, as it shows kind of down here is pure white. All the way to the left is pure dark, okay? And then this, um, the vertical axis is kind of what the output is gonna be. So if the original dark part of the image is dark and I raise this curve up it is taking those dark parts of the image and making them brighter. See how it does that? Okay. If I take the original part of the curve and I pull it down, it's making the dark parts of the image darker. Okay. So that's kind of what I want to do. I want to kind of reinforce the darkness while also uh, reinforcing the brightness. So what I've done is I've just slightly dragged down a um, a section of the dark part of the image. Okay, notice that this image's histogram starts right here, so it doesn't have any 100% blacks, and it stops right here, so it doesn't have any 100% brights. Another thing you can adjust is just by dragging these sliders to the beginning and end of the image, um, which might be doing too much, to be honest. Let's, let's pull that back. Okay. In fact, I'll step back a couple times here. This won't step back that many times. But okay, so I've, I've just dragged down a little bit on the dark side, and then you can drag up a little bit on the right side, the bright side of the image, okay, to kind of brighten the, the whites, okay? So if we preview this, what we see is this is the before, and this is after. So it's obviously adding some contrast into the image. And you can kind of overdo this. That's fine. I'm, I'm going to overdo it by a lot, okay? And then what you can do is that contrast layer um, can be, the opacity can change on it. So it doesn't have to be fully affecting the layers underneath it. You can you can adjust them to be um, so it's not quite as heavy-handed, okay? 
I think that's about right. So I adjusted my opacity to about 66%. Okay, I think that's a good contrast. Now, the problem here is, of course, that I've already made the sharpening layer that was of the lower contrast. Um, so all I'm going to do is change this to uh, maybe overlay and drop the opacity a little bit to kind of get it um, a little bit more I'm not going to do overlay. I'm going to do multiply. There we go. Okay, so that's letting some of that sharpening come back into the image without um, without reducing the contrast adjustments that I just did. And, and now that I've done that, I see that like some of the parts that I masked out down here are kind of affecting how it looks. So I'm just going to reveal a little bit more of this. In fact, I'll just get rid of my mask entirely. Okay, so by kind of adjusting um, the opacity of these two layers, and I'm kind of getting a good mix and kind of a good final image, I think. Okay, so it, it is kind of backwards that he puts the curves in the last step. This should probably be the step before the sharpening, as he mentions. Okay, and then he gets to his conclusion. So that's it. So that's the first part of our exercise done. Um, it's 3.40. So um, in the next um, video, I will be doing the colorization step of the exercise. Okay, so um, I don't think I had any viewers on Twitch, which is fine, um, because part of the reason for doing this is so that I have videos of the lectures too. Um, so I will make this available on YouTube here soon. I'll give you guys the links. I'll try to put in some timestamps um, on the video too, so that you can you know, skip over the intro if you don't want to see that part and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, this is it. Next video will be um, colorization. Okay, have a good one.